Okay, this is part six, the traditions of storytelling. And if you enjoy this series or like the videos I'm doing, um, please subscribe. Uh, also, hit that like button. And if you would like to leave a comment or not sure, if you want to leave a comment, just leave a comment. Um, I really enjoy the interaction uh, with you guys and the questions and the insights and the new perspectives you guys bring. So I really appreciate that. So in this section, we're going to look at what it's like for a culture that doesn't have a written language and what are some of the advantages and disadvantages and how human communication completely changes and how it's different from a culture such as a what we'd call like a Western European type of culture, right? Where we have a written language, we have literature, right? What about the cultures that don't? How does how does that look and how what kind of insights can that bring to you, to the seeker, to the to the word magician? What kind of insights can that bring to your own uh, thought processes and thinking, right? So Cultures with a written language have several advantages over a culture that does not have one, right? However, the wisdom of the oral tradition contains an integral understanding of humanity that's not often considered from cultures like ours that have a written language. In several key aspects, a culture with no written language is better protected from outside influences. Such a culture remains less susceptible to foreign influences, retaining its own sense of identity compared to cultures propagated by the written word. And I'll talk a little bit of, uh, more about why these cultures would be less susceptible to outside influences as well. At least in, at least when I'm talking about. Um, in their in their worldview, their fundamental way they see the world, um, it can be very difficult to influence them. Even if you bring a Western religion, even if you um, bring um, new types of clothing and um, new ideas and new technology, the worldview, the fundamental worldview, is um, much. It, it's it's less susceptible to changing. So a written language can be deciphered and interpreted in many different ways, right? Without having the author or storyteller right in front of you, what are you to do if you have questions or you don't understand a part of the story? Language typically does three things. It conveys thoughts, emotions, and volition. Volition is the, the will, right? The written word by itself cannot convey the full depth of human communication, right? It's, it's rather flat. You can be very descriptive and you can write for tens, hundreds of pages and you can describe something really well, right? But it still doesn't have that entire spectrum, right? Only direct interactions between people can offer the full spectrum of communication, right? A good writer can, can bring the thought, emotion, and volition into the pages, but it requires the reader to pick some of that up. And so there's going to be some lost in some, uh, there's going to be some things that are interpreted differently by each reader. I guess the takeaway is going to be a little bit different as opposed to having someone from your culture standing right in front of you, especially if you're in a, uh, a tribal, a more um, cohesive, more tight-knit um, uh, civilization, then it's going to be um, even more so, right? Try remembering everything you learned in school, right? Most of it was presented to you in text, right? 
Now think back to a time when you were fully engaged in an experience where you learned something new, right? All of your senses were being used, right? You were fully engaged in this newness, this experience, whatever you were learning, right? You probably remember the actual experience and retained what you learned far better than just reading about a concept or someone's secondhand experience through a story, right? So engagement is how good storytellers teach, and this is the purpose of ceremony as well, right? Which is to convey an experience to the audience by an imprinting of sense stimulation. So if you, if you invoke all five senses into the experience, then you're going to remember that experience. You're going to learn that experience. You're going to intuit certain things of that experience. That, in, that implicit or intuitive learning is going to come into you a different way than this explicit learning. Explicit would be more like someone just telling you something, just dry information, a, a, you know, like a college lecture or something, right? That's just boring city. Just read uh, this text here and bring in the information, right? It's kind of dry. It doesn't open up all of your senses, right? Now imagine if you were learning how to dance and you were, had a, and they were teaching how to dance around a campfire and you had people playing drums and playing different instruments and you were dancing and you had all of your, you know, you could smell the dirt. Maybe it rained a little bit and there was this, there was this smell of that um, water mixing with the, the dirt. And you had all of your senses, right? There was smoke and you could feel the heat. All of these senses um, are what really solidify the experience. So that's what a good writer is going to do um, is, you know what a fire feels like, you know what smoke smells like, you know all these different things, right? But if you're actually there with a storyteller and the story is bring the storyteller is bringing the experience that they had to you. They're right in front of you. There's a more uh, the channel of communication is going to be far more faithful than it were if you were just reading a story, right? And also just and also watching a movie as well, right? The storyteller is going to bring something to you that you wouldn't have otherwise, okay? So it's true that members of any given culture can read their sacred texts, right? And derive deep meaning from it, right? There's a lot of great literature in our culture that we can um, extract a lot of wisdom from. Yet this remains a flat echo in comparison to the relationship of the storyteller with the audience. It's volition and the emotions which contain more primary meaning for us than the intellectual words we invent to describe the experience, right? You may not always know how to explain what you want or explain how you feel, but there is no doubt how you feel about something and how you understand something, right? But it's hard to get that out in words and convey that to someone else, right? So it's a two-way street, right? The storyteller is here. Um, imagine you're around a campfire and you have this great uh, story. Someone's telling a story and they're walking around or looking at you and they're, you know, um, it's a two-way street because they're bringing, they're channeling in a way. A good storyteller is channeling their experience. I mean, look at, look at this village elder here. He's telling a story to a group of children and he's he's becoming, maybe he's talking about a monster, right? And he's he's channeling this monster and he's bringing this up, right? So this, this type of um, communication is when we're talking about transferring um, knowledge, transferring what we understand, transferring experience to others, this is the most faithful way to do it, right? The wisdom keeper or the storyteller knows what to emphasize. Now, the storyteller has to be paying attention to the audience, of course, but they know what to emphasize. 
assuming they're a good storyteller, they they have instant feedback from the audience, right? They can see the facial expressions. They can see, um, they can hear the um, the audience. They can, you know, there's a lot of visual cues. And they know where to take the story next based on the feedback they get from the audience. When to explain more, right? Maybe they look puzzled. Maybe they're not sure, you know, what he's trying to describe. And when to take a break or when to stop, right? So the Native Americans of North America are known as a high context culture. Pretty much any tribal um, civilization or culture, any tribal culture without a written language is going to be a high context culture. And a high context culture communicates and thinks about the world in a completely different way than a low context culture. Relying solely upon the oral tradition and direct human interactions to pass along a culture's wisdom and customs means that such a culture experiences far less fragmentation and misunderstandings in communication than a low context culture would. To a Westerner, a story told to them by a Native American may seem long-winded and that the person speaking to them is wandering around and not getting to the point quick enough. In a tribal culture, however, context matters and background information is very much necessary in the overall big picture sense of the story. It's like creating a spider's web where everything is interconnected, right? This doesn't mean there is there are no disagreements in high context cultures, but the way disagreements are reconciled, the way they're handled differ greatly between these two groups. This image here is the um, this is called the man in the maze. And this there's a lot of stories and legends. This this is the um, the great seal of the uh, Gila River, uh, Maricopa, um, the Gila River Indian community. Um, by the way, the the Pima tribe salt says salt on that sign there. It says Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. Pima is not really a, the name of a tribe. That's a name that the Spanish gave the the um, people in that area when they came down to the southwest in Arizona, um, in central central Arizona. The, 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 the people there are called the, well, there's the, the river people, the Akmel Otum, and then there's the land people, um, the Tono Otum, and then there are, um, there's the Maricopa tribe, which came later. They came, I think they came from California. But Pima... Um, the word Pimash is, uh, is a, is um, a, I think that's a Tono Otum word. Um, that means I don't know. And so they would try to communicate with the Spanish and they would say Pimash, Pimash. And, and the Spanish, uh, just started calling, uh, them Pima, but Pima is not really, um, the name of the tribe. Um, but this man in the maze is, there's a creation story there's a creation myth associated with this and there is um, I think is I think their god is called Liti I'm probably not saying that correctly but Liti or Leoti he is this this he's the man in the maze but also the man in the maze is of course a uh, it describes your life and all of the different events uh, that surround your life and and this center of the maze, this kind of returning to source. Um, I've heard this described in many different ways by members of the tribe. Um, and it's it's very much open to interpretation, but essentially this man in the maze is your journey, right? And it's a, it's a beautiful um, emblem and you see it all over the desert Southwest, especially in the Phoenix area if you're if you're going uh, through, 
any of the, the reservations local to the Phoenix area, you're going to see this Man in the Maze seal. And um, there's a lot of folklore uh, associated with it. It's very, very interesting. So the um, let's go from one indigenous group to in one part of the world to another um, in uh, the British Isles. A prime example of the wisdom of the oral tradition rests in the Celtic tribes of Ireland. At the time of the Roman conquest, it proved to be quite difficult to usurp the culture of the prehistoric peoples of Ireland because they had no written language to decode. Um, these aren't actually people that came out of the hills that are still living that way. It's just, obviously, it's a reenactment. <laughs> um, but the Celts' spoken language was entirely their own, and it remained indecipherable to the Romans as there was no real way to study it, right? You couldn't take any of their literary works. You couldn't take any anything like that and cast spells into it, right? Or put write down laws and hand it to them and say, here, this is the law now, right? You couldn't do anything like that, right? So they were uh, insulated from this kind of influence of any kind of word magic or word sorcery uh, wouldn't have any effect on them because they weren't um, they didn't have a written language, right? But they're, they're so it was nearly impossible to um, post something up and say, well, this is the law now, right? Right. It's really uh, difficult. So these these type of cultures without a written language are a lot. Uh, how you would say, like a they're they're a closer knit group right? And they have, they have a way of communicating with each other that requires face-to-face -face contact, right? You don't just write down and hand a bunch of laws around and, you know, it's, it's a very different way to communicate as a human being. Here's another example of a culture that is from the British Isles. This group is actually a Celtic uh, group and they live in France. Um, and there's cultures like these scattered here and there that have survived into modern day. And they're kind of in these strange little, um, they exist in these small little pockets, right? And they still speak these pre-written languages or prehistoric languages. This picture was taken during a festival in Brittany, which is a peninsula in Western France. And the Breton people of this region speak a dialect classified by linguistic experts as an insular Celtic language. It means their language is completely unlike uh, any languages spoken on the continent. So, you know, there's there's French spoken um, to this, you know, f further to the south. There's, there's Spanish. Uh, there's English to the north, just across the channel. Their language is completely unlike... Uh, any language, and of course, because they originally, this group of people came from the British Isles. So their dialect is related closer to Cornish and Welsh from the southwest regions of Britain. It's believed that the two main branch languages of the British Isles, both Gaelic and Britonic, and their subsequent dialects co-evolved together. It's likely that differing tribes on the British Isles were able to to find enough common ground linguistically in order to effectively communicate across cultures while retaining their unique identity, right? There are certain um, verbal cues in a culture that exist that don't translate as well, right? There's just certain things in different cultures that uh, unless you're explicitly told, um, there's no way to know, right? So the direct experience, so, so now we've got a few examples of some cultures in the world that exist and have a high contextual um, worldview. They have a high contextual culture. And in their high contextual culture, everything is, they're a little more, 
uh, tightly knit. They're more uh, integrated with each other's understanding of the world than a low context culture such as such as ours. So now let's talk about what it would be like to have an experience and then try to communicate that experience to someone else. And we'll look at that through the you can think of it as occurring through the eyes of someone of a high context culture or a low context culture. Um, but let's think about, because when it comes to word magic, we want to think about exactly how do we take what we know or what we think we know, what we've experienced or what we believe we experienced. How do we translate that? How do we, how do we interpret that ourselves and then how do we tell it to someone else and how how does that how does it even work because that's a huge part of word magic is basically word magic is how to th- how to interpret how to think about what you're interpreting and how to take that interpretation how to take what you've just thought how to put that into words for others right and how to do the reverse as well so in this in this experience we have in the world right? The direct experience is primary, right? What we experience, the rawness of reality is this, this, the most primary thing. It exists without words. It came into being without any kind of manual or rule book or language, right? It just came into being, right? Followed, and this is followed by the mind, us trying to, uh, attempting to map this direct experience, to points of reference in our culture so that the story can be conveyed to other members of the same tribe or group or culture, right? We, we need to have some sort of common ground in our culture in order to communicate, right? I have to recognize this and you have to recognize this is more or less the same thing so we can actually communicate, right? So in a sense, the telling of a story is no less than fifth-hand information. It even goes into sixth-hand information. You think that you're telling a story to someone else and they're getting it second-hand, right? But if we really dig deep enough, we shall see that actually there's a lot more going on. There's every time the every time something has to transfer from one phase to another, right? It it kind of if we if we phase change in a way if we if we change phases then that kind of turns it into you know first hand second hand third hand you know it it maps to the amount of times that we phase change the amount of times that we transform an experience to what we perceive to what we think about to what we talk about every one of those little steps is a transformation and i'll detail those in the next um couple of slides here so you so I can illustrate exactly what I'm talking about here so between the direct experience processing of that experience perception of the experience and thinking about it until it reaches the audience quite a few overlooked transformations have taken place when it comes to the spoken word when it comes to relaying our story to someone else, right? Each transformative step is an operative change, or it's a, you could say it's a phase change, from the original experience into something slightly different, right? It's that, it's that phrase, you know, you had, oh, you had to have been there, right? To really fully grasp what the experience was like. You had to have been there, right? So how do we take someone there as closely as possible? And what are the steps involved? Because if we don't know the steps that are involved and we're not aware of each of these transformative processes in our reality, then we're not going to be very good communicators. We're not going to be good thinkers. We're not going to be, um, we're not going to grow as seekers, right? Until we understand, at least understand these steps. We don't have to commit these to memory, but we have to realize in our awareness that these that these exist, 
And it's, it's sort of one of those things that once you realize something exists, there is no committing to memory. There is no, you know, you're not just going to spout off a bunch of facts and impress everyone with what you know. It's just once you're aware of it, it's, you can't become unaware of it, right? So it's not about filling your head with information. It's more about just slowly notching up your awareness bit by bit by bit right there isn't some concept for you to grasp to grasp here it's mostly just here's some awareness here's some here's a little bit of awareness right that's all hi this is the end of this part of the video stay tuned for the continuation next week if you enjoy what i'm doing please subscribe hit the like button and uh, feel free to add your comments as well thanks so much for watching see you next week